Hey, welcome to the Push Pull Sales and Marketing Podcast. I'm Marcello. And I'm Sherry. And each episode will provide you with sales and marketing strategies that you can implement immediately into your own business. Today, we are interviewing Paul Smith, who is the author of Sell with a Story, along with two other books, Lead with a Story and Parenting with a Story, um, which I already added to my Amazon list. (laughs) Um, He is one of the world's leading experts on business storytelling and does keynote speaking and training for some huge clients like Ford, Walmart, Procter & Gamble, Hewlett Packard. Um, and a bunch more. I'm sure you've heard of them. Um, Paul has an awesome bio, obviously, and I'm sure he has tons of information to share with us today. So I'm so excited that you're here, Paul. We appreciate you coming on. Uh, you're, you're very welcome, Sherry. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, we um, got a chance to read through the book. So we'll be talking a lot today about Sell with a Story, um, probably you know how that came about and the book itself. It is a great mm-hmm. tool. Um, as listeners of our podcast know, Marcello is the the sales guy here. He's um, the sales manager. He he reads a ton about it. He practices it, and he loved it. And um, which is it's hard to do in a world filled with so many how to books, so many self help books, so many mm. um, you know sales books alone to really set yourself apart. And um, we were both really impressed with how the book was laid out and um, the the messages that you that you got across. And then when I went onto your website and began reading more about you, you know, it was less of a surprise how well written the book was because you have dedicated years and years and years to storytelling and not just storytelling but storytelling for business right um so well, thank you that's very flattering oh good um so other than that that was kind of like the brief version but how did you get to this point what brought you to the books and the public speaking um and even you know do you have family any of that kind of fill in the cracks who's paul smith yeah yeah so you know my my first 22 years in the, in the business world was was pretty typical. Uh, I mean, I, um, I I worked a couple of years at uh, Accenture, which was Arthur Anderson and Company back then, and then uh, went to business school to get an MBA, and then uh, Procter and Gamble hired me from there, and spent the next 20 years at P and G, and and you know various and increasing levels of management, and like I said, a pretty typical career path. And mm-hmm. I think at some point along that path, and probably 15 years into it. I think I finally it finally dawned on me that storytelling was a a leadership skill that if I wanted to be successful that I should really have and and that wasn't something they taught me in business school and that wasn't something they taught me at P and G and you know in a new hire class or something it was um, and so if I wanted to learn it I was just going to have to figure out how to learn it on my own and so I just started watching the executives and leaders that I I most admired and I that I thought did a really good job of it and. And still didn't really know how, so I, I read all the books on the topic, and and still didn't really know how to do it. And I ended up just starting starting to interview uh, senior leaders and the executives and CEOs of companies all over the world, quite frankly, to to figure out this mysterious thing called storytelling. And and at some point along the way, it kind of dawned on me that if, if I was that interested in this topic, probably other people would be as well. So it, it stopped being just Paul Smith's personal learning journey, and and kind of became an idea for a book. And um, and, and, and so the book came out, I still had my full-time job. Um, right. and, uh, I didn't really know where that was going to lead, but, um, uh, but it, it ended up, I just, I guess really just surprising me with how many people were interested in that, because I think it's now, and it's the, the first book, the lead with the stories now, and it's, I think eighth printing and it's in six or seven languages around the world. And wow. so I pretty quickly started getting phone calls from, from people all over the place saying, Hey, can you, can you come and teach our leaders how to be better, better leaders through this authentic storytelling? And, and so it ended up leading to a complete change of career. So I ended up leaving P and G and and became a full time author and speaker and trainer. And you know that led to the second book, and now here to the to the third book. And so yeah, my my entire career has changed to being one that does this full time, simply based on that that original uh, yeah. observation that storytelling really was a, a key component of, of leadership. 
Absolutely. And I think it's interesting that you pinpointed that and that you took the time and effort to go seek that information out. You know, this isn't just you theorizing or, you know, you trying things out. You you went to the, the people who were really doing it well, tried to pinpoint what the differences were there. Um, and I think storytelling, at least for me, what isn't always one of the first things that comes to mind in business, you know, right, we tend not. to get caught up in the analytics and what's the point and, you know, what are the, what's the outline, what are the bullet points? And we forget that personal touch, even though in our daily lives, we story tell pretty much nonstop. Yeah. You know? <laughs> That's <laughs> we're a good observation. We do. When we're talking to friends and family, we're not like, and here are the bullet points for my day. We're like, right. oh, this morning we went to blah, blah, blah. Um, so that was kind of an interesting thing. And it, I could see why it struck such a nerve with people, um, in a good way. Um, yeah. and, and why it really exploded for you, um, because of the two parts, because it was needed because it works, um, or three parts, you know, because you put in the time and the research, um, to make sure that this wasn't just Paul Smith's, you know, advice on storytelling. Right. This this is a broader view of what has worked for a lot of really successful people. Yeah. Um, yeah, I tried to do that, by by the way, with all of them. Because, yeah, I, I can't imagine writing an entire book about just what I think about any one particular topic. I mean, yeah. I, just, I, just, I can't imagine that being that interesting or, or thorough for anybody. I know there are people that, that, that do write books that's just – my 40 years in the oil and gas business, here's what I think, you know, or whatever. But right. no, for all of them, I, I interviewed hundreds and hundreds of people, um, you know, and for, the, for this current book on, on sales, of course, I interviewed um, uh, sales, professional salespeople at over 50 different companies around the world. And, and, and interestingly, I interviewed um, procurement people as well. So, so professional oh. buyers. And I, I really, I, initially, I did that as kind of a lark. I thought, well, that'll be interesting. I'll throw in a few interviews with buyers. And by the end of the research, I'd concluded that I was learning more from the professional buyers than the professional sellers. And I think the reason is because, you know, who better to tell you whether or not a sales story works or doesn't work than the buyers right. who listen to them all day long and make the decision on which products to buy and which ones don't. So that turned out to be the, the smartest part of the research on this book. That's interesting. Um, and one of my big questions is, you know, how I think a lot of times when we hear storytelling, um, we start to think like, well, how can I create something or how can I like almost manufacture a story that'll be mm -hmm. relevant? And, and that's not where you're coming from. You're coming from, this needs to be an authentic thing that happened that somehow relates. Um, do you have any advice? And I know the, the book is, is full of kind of walking you through the steps um and i believe it was 24 is it 24 stories to have in your repertoire you you reference yeah um which sounds like a lot but that makes sense so if you kind of already have them in your head ready to pull in any given situation that might be applicable do you have any good examples of an authentic story that you use or that you've heard or one of your favorites from the book yeah, so so there's several questions in there. Let me kind of un yeah, sorry. <laughs> unpack it. That's all right. Um, so I'll definitely get, get to an example. Let me ask you, your, your first question I think was about uh, people don't oh, think of, of stories as real things that happen. They, when they think about storytelling, they think, oh, I need to sit down and make up a good story. Mm -hmm. And you can do that. I mean that that's okay. Um, but that shouldn't be the pl first place that you go to try and come up with a great story. shouldn't be to sit down and write fiction. The first place you should look is for things that, that actually happen to you or to somebody else. So um, the, the best type of storytelling is simply a, a recount of something that actually happened to you or to somebody else or a customer of yours or a supplier of yours or your neighbor or whatever. Mm -hmm. Those are the kind of genuine, authentic stories that really – move people. Now, I, I do tell people, if you if you really can't think of, of any, and you've done your homework, and I've, I can give you lots of advice on where to go look for these stories, if you really can't find one, yes, it is okay to make one up, but only under one condition, and that condition is that your audience knows you made it up, right? Because yeah. otherwise, you're just a liar, right? And you right. com you'll completely lose all 
respect. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, so, um, so that should be the last place that, that you look. Um, yeah. um, well, they should be real an interesting stories. point, too, that it doesn't have to be your own story, you know, and, and if you're pulling from customers and friends and family and neighbors and community and your own experiences – then then absolutely you have you have a big pool of right. ideas to to pull from and once you're looking for you know this what the story when it happened it might might have uh you might have a different perspective now looking back on it so right um, yeah so well something so imagine it. about stories like about you versus other people imagine what would you think about somebody who who all the stories they tell are about themselves right that's true they, they, I mean, you'd think of them as, I don't know, just a self-absorbed, you know, right. I, I don't, not somebody you want to spend a lot of time with, right? right? So yeah, you definitely need to have stories about other people in your repertoire. In fact, those should be the majority of your stories. You can have stories about you and, and, and of the stories about you, they shouldn't all be about how you were the awesome hero, <laughs> right. right? And you should have stories about your biggest failures and, right. you know, because that, that people will learn from that a lot more. And, and plus it just humanizes you. In, in the eyes of the other people. So, yeah. So, uh, so let me get to the second part of your question, which is a, an example. Um, and yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll give you a, a personal one, one that actually happened to, to me a year ago. Um, last May, my wife and I were at a, um, an art fair at Coney Island in Cincinnati. And because <clears throat> my, my wife's an artist, and so she loves to go to these things. And she was actually looking for a piece for our, our son's bathroom at home. And so I go to this uh, show with her and and the truth is I'm just kind of walking behind carrying the bag. She's she's the real artist. I don't I don't really know what I'm doing at a place like that, but I'm you know I'm I'm there in support of my wife and um and we get to this booth of this one guy <clears throat> named Chris Goog and he's he does these mesmerizing photographs of of underwater sea life uh, that you know sea anemones and coral reefs and just beautiful stuff that takes your breath away and she's flipping through you know a lot of his pictures and she gets emotionally attached to this one picture that to me looked about as out of place as a pig in the ocean. And if you, if you read that part of the book, you know it did because it was a picture <laughs> of a pig in the ocean, right? And I just thought this is the craziest thing. So when I got my chance, I asked the artist, I said, dude, <clears throat> what's with the pig in wow. the ocean? How did you get this pig to swim in the ocean? And he said, oh, is it, <clears throat> it was the craziest thing. He said, uh, that picture was taken off the beach of this uninhabited island in the Bahamas called Big Major K. And he said, apparently what happened was a few years ago, some local entrepreneur decided to buy a bunch of pigs to to raise for bacon as a bacon farm, I guess. And and he said, so he throws them out there on this on this uninhabited island where he can keep them for free. And he said, but if you look in the picture, and he points and he said, look behind the pig up on the beach. And he said, what do you see there? And I looked and I looked and I said, well, I don't see much other than cactus. And he said, yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> Pig, pigs don't like cactus. And he said, so they, they weren't thriving. Yeah. And he said the good news was uh, not long after that, a local uh, restaurant owner on one of the neighboring islands started boating his kitchen refuse every night over to Big Major K and dumping it a few dozen yards offshore. And he said, so these hungry little pigs start to smell you know, this food out there, and eventually one of them kind of braves the waters to go out there and eat, and then the second, and then the third. And he said, you know, it's two or three generations later, and now all the, the pigs on this island can swim. He said, in fact, nobody calls it Big Major K anymore. They call it Pig Island. And he, wow. he said, in fact, it made it so easy for me to get the picture, he said, because these pigs have learned that if a boat is coming to shore, it means they're going to get fed. So they <laughs> so all swim out in. to the boat. <laughs> yeah. And so he said, I didn't even have to get out of the boat to take this picture. Normally, I've got to get my scuba equipment on and it's this big production, you know. So before he'd even finished telling me the story, I'm like, I've got my credit card out and I slap it down. I'm like, I will yeah, take, really? it. <laughs> yeah, I'll take it. I'll take it now. And, you know, and the reason, of course, was, you know, two minutes ago, that picture was worth nothing to me, you know, mm -hmm. but. Two minutes later, after hearing that story, of course, I had to have it. And the reason is because, you know, I was not just buying a picture anymore. I was buying a story, yeah. right? And a great story that I love to tell everybody that comes into my house. Right. And here, here it's, this, it's this combination of history lesson and geography lesson and animal psychology lesson yeah. all rolled into one. And so that, that's an example of a story of one of the 24 or 25 types of stories that I talk about in the book. That one is a, a value-added story. So I, it, it's a story that actually makes the product you're selling mm -hmm. worth more money to yeah. the person buying it, right? So and that's just one of 25, 24, 25 types, but it's a powerful one, right. um, as you can tell, because it really uh, makes the thing you're buying more, more valuable. 
Absolutely. And I thought it was interesting um, when you started telling the story about the story, you're in such a habit of going through um, the couple things that you mentioned that every story should have. So I might be missing a couple here, but I noticed yeah. you you gave the time, you know, about a year ago, um, we went to, you know, you gave the place, you set up the characters, you and your wife, and, and kind of included some of your personality behind it, your thoughts, what you were thinking, yeah. kind of the, the emotion behind it, the feelings of the day, and really placed people into that scene. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought that was an interesting point when you laid it out in the book. And I think it really starts to um, get the wheels turning in the creative process when you're laying that out for people. You know, what? when did this happen? Where did it happen? Who was it happening to? Um, you know, automatically gets those wheels turning for, for the great storytelling. Is there any other, um, I guess, characteristic there that I missed? Yeah, yeah. So that that's a great start. So all all stories need to start with a where and a when and a who and what mm-hmm. they're doing, right? So where and when did it happen? Who's the hero and what did they want? Um, you know, and then you get into the problem or opportunity. So I I, I kind of lay out the structure of a story starts with those things. That's the context. Mm-hmm. And if you skip the context, by the way, I mean people will like wonder, well, is this a story you're making up or is this something right. that really happened, right? But if you right. tell them where and when and who, they get some concrete details like that it makes it it, it makes it very clear that it's real to you you know as, yeah, a, as a human um you get a little bit of an insight into you you feel like you're there a little bit more and have more of a connection right so so that's the beginning so the, the context then you move on to the challenge like what was the problem or opportunity that the the hero or i, I should really say the protagonist right the person or the animal in that case that the story is about what problem or opportunity did they run into? So for the pigs in the Pig Island story, they were the heroes and the where and the when is, of course, you know, a few years ago I, on Big Major K. The problem they ran into is that there was no food there, right? That's a, pro- that's a big problem, right? right? right. You know, so then the, the next is the conflict and that is the, str- the struggle essentially. And so these mm-hmm. pigs had to struggle to survive and they weren't doing it very well until this – you know, the food started getting dumped offshore. And so this, you know, the struggle of trying to learn to swim in the ocean, which pigs are probably not naturally inclined to do unless there's a very high motivation for, for them to go do it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so now we've moved from context to, ta- to challenge to conflict, and then the resolution is at the end. So how did it turn out in the end? Well, the pigs learned to swim, so they, they got to survive, right? And that's kind of the natural progression of questions that, the human brain seems to need to hear and in that order for a story to progress. And so once you've gone through those kind of four steps, you're technically done telling the story. But if it's a sales story, now it's time to to move some action or drive some sales or do, do something with the story. You're not just trying to entertain people. So there's mm-hmm. there's a, the last two questions that you've got to answer then are what did you learn and what do you want me to do about it? Right? What should I go do now that I've heard this story? And so – you know, for for uh, Chris Goog and the the Pig Island story, of course, he didn't even have to tell me what to do right. because, in fact, a great story does that. So if if you if you've chosen a great story and done it justice, you don't have to explain the lesson or recommend action. It will drive the people to understand the lesson, and and know what to do. So I immediately wanted to buy um, the the picture, right. but if your story didn't. If they didn't get there, or if they if they learned a different lesson than you intended them to learn, or if you just you really need to make it clear, look, now that you've heard that, you know, here's what I think you ought to go do. This is your time to do it, right? Right after you've you've told the story. Right, and I think that's an important point too that that if you're having to explain the point of your story too much, then then maybe it's not the right story for that yeah. situation. Maybe you're kind of grasping right. at straws. Um, it should it should make sense um, for the person that you're telling it to, at least in that context. Yeah. Um, so value-added story um, obviously makes sense, especially in a sales situation. What's another top type of story that can really help the sales process. Yeah, so so let me just kind of give you the overview of the the 24 or 25 yeah, stories. So what what yeah, what I found was that in interviewing these sales and 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 procurement people is that that sale great sales stories are being used in every step of the sales process. And I I had assumed naively that it would just be two or three places, but if you, if you look at a pretty typical sales process, it goes from as early as introducing yourself to a new prospect to building rapport with a buyer, to the main sales pitch itself, to handling objections, to closing the sale, and then service after the sale, if I could just use broad buckets like mm-hmm. that. 
and it turns out people are – great salespeople are using storytelling in, in all of those. So at the very beginning, in that introductory period, you know, you could use a story that would just explain what it is that you do in a simple way that anybody can understand. You know, you're at a, a, a co- an industry conference and you're just meeting somebody at the hors d'oeuvres table and you have no idea if they're going to be somebody that would be a client or not or a prospect or not. And you just need to explain what you do. And, and what most of us do in those situations is say, well, I'm – in charge of uh, efficient logistics handling, you know, to optimize the process of delivery from the core manufacturing center to the desired consumer experience, or you know, <laughs> right. some just set of buzzwords like that, or job titles that that doesn't mean a lot to most people, you know. Or you could tell them a quick story about you know how uh, how you help make sure that the chicken gets from the chicken farm to the grocery store without right. spoiling, you know. And and it just, it just makes so much more sense and be easier for somebody to wrap their mind around what it is that you do, right? Yeah, so and it's so refreshing to just hear yeah. human words coming out of somebody's mouth, like, right. like <laughs> relatable things instead of, you know, this is what I do. And like right. you said, all the buzzwords. Yeah, like a robot or something. So, yeah. Yeah, so so stories like that at the beginning, and then and then when you're you're in the rapport building stage, there's a, several types of stories you can tell. So a, a why I do what I do story mm-hmm. to help somebody understand, you know, why did you choose the profession you chose? I mean, mm-hmm. pe- people want to do business with people that, that they think are doing it for, pa- yeah, that they've got some passion for it, right? I mean, you can't just tell people I'm passionate about my job. Well, well yeah. you know, tell me the story about why you chose this job, and I'll I'll get it, you know, or a um, or an I'll tell you when I made a mistake job. Or I'll tell you when I can't help you. Uh, story, um, mm-hmm. you know. So those are stories that help people understand. Look, I'm not just going to try and sell you everything that I have on my sales list, regardless of whether you need it or not, right? right. And and you can't just tell people I'm I'm going to be that kind of salesperson. But if you tell them a story about a previous client or a current client or customer that you did that to, mm-hmm. you know, the time where you know you told Bob or Sally, look, I got five things I need to sell, <laughs> but three of them you don't need. Right. And here are the three you don't need, but these two you do. And let me, t- you know, and 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 I and I maybe could have sold them three of the other three, but I didn't because I just I I know that they don't need it, and I and I want people to believe me when I tell them I'm the best solution for you on these things, and so I need to be honest with you and tell you when I'm not the best solution. Yeah. And so a stories like that that will help win you, you know, that kind of favor. Or you know, if you get when you get into the main sales pitch, there's some obvious places. I mean, the the my products invention or discovery story. You know, how did whoever invented the product that I'm selling? How did they invent it? You know, mm-hmm. that that tells people a lot about who the product is designed for and what it's designed to do. Or or problem stories like t- tell me a story about somebody like me who's got a problem that I probably have that your product is the solution for. Then I can see myself, you know, using it right. Yeah. Um, or as you move even further through the the whole process to uh, to closing the sale, a, a story to create a, a sense of urgency, you know, because we've all got those people that, gosh, I've, I've, we've been in the sales call three times now. You've said you need my product; it's affordable. I'm the one that you want, so I'm going to order it. But now's not the right time. Yeah, maybe in a month or two or six months from now. Well, you, you know, stories. I found great salespeople using stories to help people understand. Look, here here's what can happen if you wait. Mm-hmm. You know, these here, and and I'll tell you about what happened to my last client who waited Mm -hmm. and six months later regretted waiting because these three things happened. And if they had had my product before that, those things wouldn't have happened. And so don't, don't put yourself in that situation. So those are just examples of the kinds of stories that great salespeople are are using. And, And most of them don't know that there's, you know, 24, 25 different types of stories they should have. They've, they've mostly got four or five. And so that was, I think the biggest eye opening thing for me is yeah. how many more types of sales stories you could have in your repertoire if you just knew that you needed them. Yeah, and I can see that really setting you apart um, because like you said, the the buyers or whoever you're meeting with as the salesperson, that's what they're doing. They're hearing these pitches day in and day out. And mm-hmm. if you have um, you know four stories to pull from that are probably kind of similar to what a, a lot of other people are presenting, um, you know, this seems like such a worthwhile thing to put a little bit of time into up front to to have in your toolbox um, to use when you're there face to face with the client. Um, So with writing these books, um, what is the difference between lead with a story and sell with a story? What were the different inspirations there? Yeah, so so the I, I kind of went over the the inspiration for the first book um, mm-hmm. with my you know my first twenty some odd years in the business, and that's what led to the the first one. 
Um, and then the this this third one, it, it really, I, I can't even take credit for it. So it wasn't even my idea. So it was actually my publisher's idea. Um, and so after the Lead with a Story came out and then Parenting with a Story was my second book, which is really just a, a collection of short stories from 100, you know, original short stories from 100 different people around the world that I, that I interviewed um, to help teach kids um, character and life lessons, right? So I, I think of the, um, you know, the two or three most life-changing moments in your life that you learned a super valuable lesson from. Mm -hmm. Imagine if you had a hundred of, 101 of those type of stories from somebody around the world. Yeah. That's what it is. Very and so, powerful. yeah. And so that one came out and then, and my publisher just said, look, we, we like this franchise. So lead yeah. with the story, parenting with the story. It's working. We think, yeah, we, it's working. <laughs> we think sell with for salespeople really is the next one. And, and as I was looking at my client base, people that hire me to come teach their, their leadership about mm -hmm. storytelling. One of the biggest sets of clients I get are sales teams. And so I was here, I was seeing this need from them as well. So uh, putting all those things together, that just kind of seemed to be the, the next logical step. But the, the difference between them is the, how you craft these stories is not super different. I mean, st storytelling is storytelling. So in both books, I cover structure of a story and how to use emotion and use the element of surprise and metaphors and character development, and plot development. So some of those things are, are arguably similar. What's, mm -hmm. what's very different are when the, the kinds of stories you need to tell. So as a leader, the, kind, the kinds of stories you need to tell are vision stories or leading change stories or get, you know, stories to get people to work together more collaboratively or get people to be more innovative and creative or, you know, things like the things that leaders do mm -hmm. for, for sales. It's the, you know, the, the book is about the 25 stories that salespeople need to tell the ones that we just talked about. So, right. the, so the examples of the stories that you need to tell are completely different in both books, how to do it. There's definitely some overlap, like I said, because storytelling is, is storytelling. Sure. Yeah. Did you do some research just even related to um, like book writing as far as yeah. the format of storytelling? Like it sounds like a lot of the stuff that we would learn, you know, back in high school, if we were trying to write a, a fiction, you yeah. know, write a fictional story and here's, here's the pieces that you need. Um, yeah. Yeah, I did. In fact, uh, I mean, all the way back to uh, Aristotle's poetics is probably the earliest that, um, you know, the, the form of storytelling that that was documented. And yeah, so I, I'm, I probably geek out a little bit too much on uh, doing the research for these books. I, I probably read 40 or 50 books uh, in preparation for each of the three books that I that I so over 100 books in, in total and academic articles and so yeah, I I I don't want to write a book that's already been written, yeah. and I and I don't want to write one that that ignores wisdom that's already out there. So yeah, I did a lot of that kind of what I would call secondary research, yeah, in a, for all of these books as well. Well, in addition to my primary research of interviewing leaders and salespeople and procurement people and stuff like that. Yeah, and I I as has been shown with the success of the books that that the audience really appreciates that they they appreciate. Um, the research that goes into it and the way that you package it all, you know, it's, it's laid out in a way that makes sense. Whereas if, you know, nobody is going to go read 40 to 50 books on this particular topic. Um, right. <laughs> but if they can get, glean some of the best information from you, um, that is extremely valuable. Um, the other question that comes to mind is since I work in the marketing realm, um, what do you think the differences between, you know, selling with a story versus marketing with a story. I think that um, a lot of people are trying to really incorporate storytelling into marketing. And I think a lot of people really hit, uh, not hit, <laughs> miss the mark yeah. um, in that regard. And, you know, the, the thing that comes to mind is um, like the about us page, you mm -hmm. know, that's supposed yeah. to be the primary storytelling page. Yeah. Um, and people might do a dry thing about here we are and this is what we do and this is how it started. Um, but I will absolutely be recommending even sell with a story to clients for those type of things to um, follow that process. And I need to do more of that myself. I tend to be um, analytical to the point um, even in my writing and, you know, it's, it's, it's a good reminder to take the step back and take the time to develop, um, the personal touch. Yeah. 
Yeah, so that's a great question. Essentially, what, what's the difference between storytelling for sales and marketing? Mm-hmm. And and I, they're they're certainly very similar. Mm-hmm. Um, and the the structure of stories, like I said, would really be largely the same for all of these, whether it's a leadership story or sales story or, or marketing story. Right. I, I think the biggest problem why you're seeing the the people missing the mark in telling stories in marketing when they do. Uh, is is a lack of understanding of what a story actually is, and, and I think that's because storytelling that, that word story and storytelling has begun to be misused and used for so many purposes in the last couple of decades that it was never intended to be used for. You know, you, you ask people today in business, you know, wh- what do you mean by storytelling, and what what they'll describe to you is something that sounds like a great speech or a great memo or a great argument. You know, it's, well, you know, if I, if I tell you, you know, there are three ways you need to, three things you need to do to be successful in this business. It's one, two, three. And and if those three things really make sense and resonate to you, that's a great story. Hmm. Well, no, that's a great speech or those are three great reasons or, but that's, that's not a story. I mean, a story you and I talked about it earlier. There's a time and a place and a main character, and the yeah. character confronts an obstacle, and they either overcome or don't over, overcome the obstacle, and there's a resolution at the end. I mean, a story is something special, yeah. right? It's like n- not every set of words constitutes poetry, right? Mm-hmm. Poetry is something special, mm-hmm. and just like a story. A story is something special. So just because you gave a great speech or you've got a great advertisement or a great marketing uh, plan doesn't mean you're telling great stories. It means you're telling great ads, right? right? So it starts with understanding that a story really is something different. And, and, um, and some, I think uh, a lot of advertising people get that. I mean, some of the best mm-hmm. short stories you'll ever see are in 30 second television commercials. Yes. Um, and, and some of television commercials are completely absent of a story. So <laughs> right. uh, there are a lot of Madison Avenue folks that really totally get this. Um, yeah. and, and I can, I can show you examples and I share those examples in the training courses that I give, mm-hmm. but I also share the examples of ones that are not. And, and I'm convinced that you need both of those. You, you, I don't think anybody should be in the marketing or sales business who only does storytelling and like, right. or, or that, that that's all they produce is storytelling. You, you need to have logical, rational reasons why people should buy what you sell. Absolutely. But if you're only communicating with rational, logical reasons why people should buy what you sell, you're going to be much less successful than if you combine it. And, and, and that's because the human brain really makes decisions emotionally and subconsciously, and then we rationalize it later in a different place in our brain logically. Right. And if, if you can convince people with a great story that they should buy your product and then you don't have the rational, logical reason for it, they can undecide later when they when they fail to be able to make logical sense of this decision. Mm-hmm. So you need both, but if but a lot of people only have one or the other, and that's a problem. Yeah, that's a really good point. And typically, do you feel like the storytelling comes first? Like that's that's one of the first draw-ins, yeah. um, and that emotional connection. And then, like you said, you know, um, you have to follow through and back it up with with. Right. Do I really need this? Yeah. And I think that's the right order because that's the correct order of decision making that all the cognitive psychologists tell us that our brains make decisions in. So you, right. you, you have to get them there first emotionally and subconsciously and then deliver yeah, the logic. Absolutely. Um, what is one of the most common questions that you hear from salespeople when you're out doing these trainings or speaking or even people contacting you after they read the book? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, a pretty typical one is how do I kick off my story? How do I start it? You know, because mm-hmm. there's, you know, if we're not used to doing Once storytelling at work. Yeah. And, and they'll <laughs> literally, so is that how I, is that how I start? And, um, and, and people will like nervously talk about their story and well, okay, so there's this, so, so let me tell you a story. Okay. Right. So, well, so the story starts, well, it starts a couple of years ago. So let me just start there. You know, and they just, they, yeah. they nervously patter on and, and are afraid to start their story. And so notice in that they've already made a few mistakes. And, and I, I tell them there are three things you should never do to start your story. Don't apologize or ask permission to tell your story. Those are the first two, right? And you've seen that happen all the time, right? You'll be in a meeting, somebody will raise their hand and say, I, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can, can I just tell a quick story? I promise right. it'll just take a minute, Right. right? So they've, they've now apologized and asked permission to tell a story. So what does that communicate to you about how valuable they think their story is? Right. I would think that this is not going to be worth my time. 
Exactly. If they're already apologizing and asking for permission, clearly they don't even think it's important enough to be shared, right? And right. and if you if you really believe that about your story, please don't tell it, yes. right? Just just get back to the bullet points on slide number 72. But right. right? But if you do think your story is worthy of being shared, then just share it. Just tell it, right? Leaders don't ask permission to lead. Right? Mm-hmm. They just lead, right? Salespeople don't apologize or ask permission to to give their sales pitch, do they? Right. They just Hopefully give it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So never apologize or ask permission to tell your story. In fact, and the the, the third one is don't even tell people you're going to tell them a story, mm-hmm. right? I mean, what, what would you think if you were in a meeting with me and I kicked off the meeting and said, all right, uh, so let's get this meeting started. And, um, well, I thought it started off by telling you a story. Right. Like, what are you already thinking? <laughs> that it's, again, that it's just not going to be valuable. It's not going to be yeah. relevant to what we're talking about. Right. It sounds uh, like I'm going to go off on a tangent now exactly. and you can tune out for the next five minutes. Uh, right. Well said. Right. But imagine if I started off the meeting this way instead. I said, well, let's go ahead and get the meeting started. And, I, um, you know, I noticed something really important happened last week and it's completely changed the way I think about running this department. And I thought I'd tell you about that. Right. You immediately now, have everybody's attention. Yeah. What's changing? What did you discover? And, right. and how is it going to help? Right. Now, in both cases, I'm going to tell you exactly the same story. Mm-hmm. But in one case, you your eyes are already rolling into the back of your head. <laughs> and in the other case, you're like, oh, wow, what happened? It was something really – that must be important and it's going to affect me. So yeah. please tell me what happened, right? So so you're, the way you start your story should be what I call a, a hook, right? And it's just – it's a half a sentence or maybe a full sentence that just tells your audience what I'm about to tell you is important to you. You're mm-hmm. going to want to listen. Right? And so that, that sentence that I used just a moment ago that, hey, something really important happened last week, totally changed the way I think about running this business. Let me tell you about that. You know, yeah. Or if you asked me a question and I wanted to answer it with a story instead of a set of facts, I might say, oh, you know, I think the best example of that I've ever seen was mm-hmm. – and then now I'm telling you a story about a time and a place and so, that something happened. I mean so that's the way to start off your story as opposed to talking about a story or apologizing or asking permission or whatever. So that, that's probably the biggest biggest question I get. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense and that's really helpful to give that example of it too. Um, you know, I think so much of it just comes back to in sales and marketing both is – just just be human who what would you say to a friend you know for some reason we sit down to write ad copy and all of a sudden we turn into you know the cheesy door-to-door guy like yes do you (laughs) need blah 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 and i'm like no no like why are we asking people all of these rhetorical questions like just say what we need to say why do you what is valuable about this yeah um you know Go ahead. Well, well the, the thing you just mentioned, it, it, it uh, reminded me, one of the questions that I asked the buyers in doing the research for this this book was, what is it that makes a, a sales pitch sound like a sales pitch? <laughs> yeah. And the first thing most of them said was exactly what just came out of your mouth. It was, mm-hmm. well, do you have this problem or this problem? Or if I could tell you I could save you 20%, oh. would you buy today? I mean, it's, it's I yeah, it's that scripted thing that, that you just, in fact, some of them said, it, it makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up as I soon as I it. hear those words. And, and so that was the, the, the first thing that a lot of people said. But, but many of them also said it was, it was when the tone of the conversation changed from something that sounded like a conversation, like you said, I haven't talking to your best friend, into something that sounded memorized and scripted. Yes. And, and they said, oh, I can always tell when the sales pitch starts because it sounds like they're, they're saying something that was written to be read instead of written to be told. Yeah. Right. And even the voice changes. Yeah. Sometimes. Like all of a sudden you take on a, a, my sales voice is out yeah. here. Um, and I think some of that is just that's what we've been hearing. You know, that's mm-hmm. what we have heard a lot. Right. Um, that's what we've been consuming. So. Shifting that into consuming um, books like yours and listening to your talks, you know, there's a lot available on the website and trying to um, retrain ourselves and and for the standard to be um, this type of storytelling instead of, uh, you know, the the cheesy car salesman ads that we have grown up with. Um, Yeah, it's hard to tell an authentic story and not sound – Authentic, right? Yeah. I mean, but but it's also just as hard to read a sales pitch script 
and sound authentic, yeah. right? So that that's why – and I'm sure there are times where you've got to have that. But when you're ready to actually tell a story, yeah. if you have a real story about something that happened to, to real people, it, you can't you can't sound like a sales pitch when you're doing it. And your audience doesn't feel like they're being pitched something, and that's part right. of the beauty of why it works. And practicing enough that you're comfortable with that, even if it is yeah. a sales pitch. If you've done it enough times – you can make it conversational. You you can be paying attention to the room and how they're responding instead of just focused on the words that are coming out of your mouth that you perfectly crafted the day before. You know, right. it doesn't have to be that. It's just um, you know each client is going to be a little bit different, and um, being aware of the people around you and how they're reaction reacting and making sure that that connection's there. Yeah. more than anything else. Yeah, I agree. In fact, well, l- let me ask you something because um, sure. you just mentioned practice because I-, I think that's important. What, what advice do you remember hearing most of your life about how to practice either a speech or a sales pitch or, or telling a story? Uh, doing it over and over and over again is yeah. always where? what I heard. Yeah, where would you do that? <laughs> right. Alone, typically, you know, yeah. in your bedroom or, you know, typically, I mean, I remember when I was young and my mom, I had a big speech coming up and she, I, I had it down pat, you know, mm-hmm. I practiced it in my room over and over again. And she was like, no, you need to, we have some friends coming over tonight and you need to tell them your speech. And I was like, um, <laughs> What? Yeah. <laughs> Why? Um, she's like, because you need to practice talking in front of people. Um, it's not the same thing. And I was like, oh, OK. And, you know, ultimately it was it was very helpful. Um, so I don't know if that was kind of where you were going with it, but I. Well, yeah, I want, I want, that's, I think, pretty typical. And I think some of that is good. I, 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 the kind of advice people have gotten most of their lives um, for giving a speech, I think, is not always good advice for practicing a story. And so let me explain the difference. So, so um, re- rehearsing like I think you were uh, being told to do was I think the kind of rehearsing that is I need to memorize this speech word for word. So I right. need to do it over and over and over again until I have it memorized. Mm-hmm. And storytelling doesn't work very well memorized because it will mm-hmm. sound memorized. Yeah. And that's the thing that makes the hair on the back of the buyer's neck stand up. So you don't want to sound memorized. So you don't want to practice your story so many times that you memorize it. Mm-hmm. Um, but you do want to practice it to where you're comfortable telling it. So what what I tell people is, well, and the other thing is not to do is don't do it in front of a mirror, right? I mean, uh, <laughs> a, a lot of people do that, but I think you end up, you end up focusing on your physical performance and your right. smile and your hand gestures and stuff instead of the story. But um, the, the best advice I give people about practicing their stories is, is like you said, alone, um, is, is fine. Um, Mm -hmm. and, uh, you just pretend you're walking, uh, walk around your office and pretend you're with your best friend, like you said earlier, and just tell them the story, Hmm. not with your notes in your hand, not with just tell them the story. And every time you tell a story, it's going to be a little bit different and that's okay. That's how stories work. Right. So I tell people to, to save their stories, to just make, use bullet points and, uh, and, and, and capture the main turning points in the story, the main facts in the, in the chronological order of the story. And that's the only thing that you should need to keep written down is right. just those bullet points. And then, and if you need to refer to it every once in a while, fine, do that. But if you actually typed out your story as a script, you'll be tempted to memorize it as a script. And then you're telling a scripted story and that's going to not sound like a story. Yeah. People pick up on it. Oh yeah. Um, do you think with the trend of live streaming, um, whether it's on Facebook or wherever else, um, do you think that that I feel like that's really pushing people um, to be more candid, to be more real, to be less <laughs> scripted, and and start to practice that um, art almost? You know, mm-hmm. even podcasting. It's like it's you know we we don't edit, we, we try not to unless you know there's yeah. something crazy going on. Um, it's just conversation and i think live streaming that's why what has drawn so many people to it that they know it's not edited that it's that it's typically not scripted you like you mm-hmm. said you might have your outline of things that you want to talk about um but you're responding in real time and i think i think it's something that's really going to help people build that skill um and it's going to bleed over into other areas of their professional lives right 
Yeah, I, I, I agree. And uh, I hadn't thought about that, but I think you're right. I, and I think that's what's attractive about it is that it's it's unscripted. Yeah. Um, if I'm reading something, I want somebody, if, especially if I'm reading a book or a magazine article, I want the author of that to have thought about this a lot and, and, and gone through their words in a painstaking manner and um, you know, and, and put a lot of uh, effort into that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when I'm hearing somebody telling a story, um, yeah, I just, I, I kind of want it to just be off the cuff. Right. Right. Absolutely. All right. Well, to wrap up, we always ask our, um, our guests here on the podcast to give our listeners a recommendation, um, that is not something of your own. So maybe a, a book or an app or a course or a tool, um, that you <clears throat> r- use yourself or have found really valuable. Yeah. Um, and so I, th- I think for, for salespeople, the thing I might suggest people try is a, uh, it's a, it's a online, it's not an app, it's not the right word, but uh, it's an online service called Sharper Axe. And what okay. they do is they let people, especially salespeople, practice their uh, sales stories um, or, or even just their sales pitches. Uh, and so it basically, obviously, it works with your uh, the, the webcam that's probably part of your computer already, but it allows you to videotape yourself telling your story, and then you can watch it and, and critique yourself. But you can also share that very easily with other people on your team or your boss or whoever you, you want to, and they are encouraged to give you feedback on it and and give their own version of that, that sales pitch or that sales story, and you can watch theirs. And then eventually when somebody does it really well – you kind of promote that one too. Well, this is now the the, the best one, the, or what they call it the guide. Yeah, and we all need to watch that one and practice that one. So it's it's a way to help people practice um, using video uh, over over the internet instead of the walking around in your office. And yeah. so you can actually get feedback from your trusted counterparts on those kind of things. So I've, I've, I'm finding a lot of people getting some use out of that. Yeah, that sounds like a great tool. Um, and then as far as your stuff, how can people find you? Yeah, thank you. So probably my website's the easiest way, and so that's um, leadwithastory.com. So just the title of the, my first book, leadwithastory.com, and you can see all my books and the training courses that I give and all that kind of stuff there, Bl- yeah. blogs and podcasts. And There's a ton of information there I was going through last night, and um, you know, I was like, oh, there's, there's a podcast. I have two little boys um they're six and three years old so the parenting with a story i'm looking forward to getting my hands on i already subscribed to that podcast and um this is it um sell with a story is the other podcast or lead with a story so lead with a story i I will eventually come out with a uh, sell with a story podcast probably in the next month or so cool We'll have to keep an eye out for that. And then there were blog posts and there's there's videos of you from speaking engagements that you've done. So it is full of information. Um, obviously, we will make sure that we link everybody up to your stuff in the show notes um, at pushpullsales.com as well so that you have it all there. Um, highly recommend the book. And like I said, uh, Marcello was disappointed he wasn't able to speak with you because he um, loved the book. He said it kept making him laugh because he works for um, – PNG Logistics, which mm-hmm. um, is the owner's initials, but he was like uh, the he loved the Febreze story. Oh yeah, um, <laughs> and loved that you had worked for you know the the main PNG that most yeah, people think PNG. of when he says he works for PNG. He's I'm like sure. no no PN like the right. letter <laughs> G. I'm sure. Um, but yes, get your hands on the book um, and go through it. You know I. Can I also, um, I had seen in the book that you send people to the link where they can print out um, some resources to be able to work through their own stories. Um, yeah, so that's, if, if you go to leadwithastory.com slash resources, all, all of the tools and templates from all of the books, uh, including Sell With A Story, this most recent one, are there. And so, so uh they won't make as much sense unless you've right. read the book, but but it it will definitely help you walk you through the the, the steps of storytelling and and the list of uh, the whole twenty five stories that we didn't have time to talk about all of yeah. them. That whole <laughs> list is is in there, and so things like that are there. And a ton of great examples and a ton of great stories. Um, obviously, the book just flows because if you're writing a book about storytelling, you know you're engaging the whole way through, and it's fun to hear um, a lot of the stories in your own repertoire. 
Thank you. Yeah, I, I'd be a hypocrite if I uh, if I didn't teach storytelling by using storytelling. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Pushes yeah. you that extra mile. Yeah, my hope is that it makes it not like most business books are quite frankly kind of boring to read. So I, my, my goal in mine is to, to to teach them with storytelling, so it, it keeps it entertaining. Absolutely, I think you meant that goal. And again, we really appreciate you coming on um, and bringing value to this audience and um, you know hopefully we we get some extra eyes on your books it absolutely deserves it um, and wish you the best we'll keep well, an thank eye you. out for all your new stuff that I'm sure is coming yes thank you very much it was a pleasure to be on here with you thanks Paul well that wraps things up for this episode but a couple quick notes for you guys um, we are going to have Paul back on the show in a couple weeks here um, you can follow us on Twitter at Push Pull Sales to make sure you see when that is released. Um, Marcello took his turn interviewing Paul and they took a deeper dive into the book and how Marcello has already started using um, the tactics from the book and the ideas of storytelling in his own sales process. Um, so like I said, keep an eye out for that. You can head to pushpullsales.com for show notes for every episode, including today's. We have linked up all of Paul's resources and make sure that you can get in touch with him there. And our sponsor for today's episode is actually ourselves. Um, if you go to pushpullsales.com slash resources, there is a whole list of books and trainings and Things that Marcello and I have read ourselves and feel like have been very valuable in our own learning process. So we have affiliate links there um, so that you can check out those resources. And we really appreciate your support. Um, as always, thank you to you guys for listening. And if you enjoy what you're hearing, please subscribe on iTunes. You can rate us there. It helps new people find us. Um and thank you to bensound.com for our intro and outro music. And of course, thank you to Paul Smith for coming on and talking with us um, in this episode and agreeing to come back again. So we will talk to you guys soon and hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye. <laughs>